Module 5 time, and the topic is, well, if you believe the book, it's Fluid Mechanics. Chapter 8 in your book is entitled Fluid Mechanics. My preferred terminology, I like to call it Fluid Dynamics. Um, and it's actually a subject near and dear to my heart. Well, why is that? My background is actually meteorology. I, once upon a career ago, I spent about a decade as a meteorologist. And this is a topic of study that I've done a lot of. Uh, so what does, let's, let's tear that term apart, Fluid Dynamics. Now, what does fluid mean when, when you hear the term? You probably think about dehydration, right? Replenish your fluids on a hot summer day. We think about liquids when we hear the word fluid, but it turns out in physics, fluids are anything that flows. So that includes both liquids as well as gases. Gases like air flow, but that's what we call wind. Wind is just the flow of air molecules. So when the fluid in fluid dynamics can be either a liquid or a gas, anything that flows. Now, there's that term dynamics. Where have we heard that before? Module two, remember? We talked about forces. Module one was about kinematics, describing how things move, speed, velocity, all that kind of stuff. Module two was about forces, which I think I, t I called dynamics. Dynamics is the study of why things move. So when we put them together, fluid dynamics, we're essentially studying why fluids, including liquids and gases, flow. And that's at the heart of meteorology. Meteorology is the study of the atmosphere. The atmosphere is just a bunch of gases that are flowing all over the place, exchanging energy and all that kind of stuff. So that's why this subject is so near and dear to my heart. In this chapter and in this module, make sure you pay attention to, the, to what I call the four horsemen. There's essentially four important principles that if you master these and can I tell them, to, I know the, the difference between them, those are the keys to fluid dynamics. The first being Archimedes' principle, essentially why things float. The second one is going to be Boyle's law. Then we've got two other principles that are very important, Pascal's principle and Bernoulli's principle. If you know these four and can differentiate between them, that's going to make the skills tests and the lab activities a whole lot easier. We're first going to tackle Archimedes' principle, and Archimedes' principle really has to deal with why things float. So let's ask, why does something float? Here's a, here's a cup, and I've got some water in there, and I've got an object. In fact, it's a block of wood, and we're going to see what happens when I drop the block of wood into the cup. Huh? It floats, right? The question is, why does it float? And if you're like me, and I know I am, I walk around the world, walk around through the world, essentially envisioning force diagrams. There's a reason why we spend a lot of time with force diagrams in module two. It's because, well, it's important. Did you watch, did you, did you want to see that again? What's going on? Block of wood, not moving. All of a sudden I drop it and it moves. And then all of a sudden it stops again, right? Do blocks of wood stop moving just because they want to stop moving? No, it's being forced to stop moving. It was falling, all of a sudden it stops falling. There is a force at work here. And that, to me, is the much more convincing way of explaining why something floats, is to talk about it in terms of forces. In fact, a force called the buoyant force, which we're going to learn about in a few slides. But sometimes, if you stop somebody on the street and say, hey, why does wood float? They're gonna give you a very pat answer. They're gonna say, Oh, it's less dense than water, which is a true answer, but to me a relatively unsatisfying answer because I want to see a force diagram, and density doesn't really tell me anything about the forces at work here when I look at this cup. But we'll tackle the density argument first, and then I'm going to try to make the convincing case that, to me, looking at it as a force issue is much more interesting and ultimately satisfying. But for the time being, let's check out density. So what does it mean when we say that something is dense? Well, you might be tempted to say that when something is dense, it is heavy, but be very careful. You imagine the little block of wood that I just dropped into the cup. Rather than a block of wood, let's imagine a, an entire log, big old log, and ask yourself which is heavier, that log of wood or my cup of water. So notice that you have to be very careful. Density is not just heaviness because the log is certainly heavier than a little cup of water. 
So be very careful that when you're talking about heaviness, make sure that you are comparing objects that are of the same size. So for example, my little block of wood, if you can imagine a little block of water, the same size, then we would say that the water is more dense because that little block of water, if we put it on a scale, would have more mass than my block of wood does. So density is not just weight, it is weight or mass per unit volume. So that's a very, very important distinction. Density is mass per unit volume. And it turns out, yes, if an object is less dense than what it is submerged in, it is going to float. That's essentially the basic rule for flotation when you're approaching it with the density argument. If you can figure out the density of the object and compare it to the density of the material that it's submerged in, you'll be able to determine whether it's going to float or not. Now, one thing that's very interesting is that an object's density is not always the same value. It can change. In fact, substances, most substance, substances get more dense as they get colder. And the reason being, essentially the atoms and molecules that make up the material get a little closer together. And therefore, they take up less volume. The mass doesn't change. The number of atoms and molecules is still the same, but they're taking up less space. And if you, again, think about the equation for density, density is mass divided by volume. So notice that as your temperature decreases, often the, vol the, the volume, V is for volume here, decreases. And so your numerator stays the same, your denominator gets smaller, which makes your overall fraction get bigger. So that is true of most substances. They get more dense when their temperature drops. Similarly, when they get warmer, their atoms and molecules get farther apart. And therefore, the volume goes up they take up more space. And if your numerator stays the same and your denominator increases, that makes the overall fraction decrease. So things tend to get less dense the warmer they are and more dense the colder they are. One very important exception to this rule is water. Water, it turns out, does get denser as you cool it down, but only to a certain point. When it gets down to about four degrees Celsius, which is about 39 degrees Fahrenheit, its density is one gram per milliliter. So if you could take a little milliliter of water, as we're gonna find out, that's also a milliliter is the same thing as a cubic centimeter. So if I could get a little cube of water, one centimeter by one centimeter by one centimeter in, dim in dimensions, and put it on a scale, it would have a mass of one gram. That's at that temperature. But it turns out, this is very interesting, as you cool water even below 39 degrees Fahrenheit or four degrees Celsius, instead of it getting smaller, instead of those, those water molecules getting closer together, it turns out they get farther apart. And therefore, even though the masses stay the same, the volume has actually gone up. And therefore the overall density of water at zero degrees Celsius, which is 32 degrees Fahrenheit, is actually less dense than water at 39 degrees Fahrenheit. And when you let water freeze, go from liquid water to uh, solid water, which we call ice, it's dense, it's even less dense. It takes up even more space for that same amount of mass, and therefore that's why ice floats in your, in your glass of water as opposed to sinks. In most cases, the solid form of a substance will be more dense than the liquid form of a substance. That is not the case when it comes to water and it's a good thing for that. If it weren't that way, the world would be an entirely different place. Since our focus so far has been on density, uh, of course, you know the, the equation for density has to do with mass and volume. Density is mass divided by volume. And normally in a traditional class, in a traditional lab, you would actually go down and take some mass measurements and some volume measurements. You take the mass measurements using what are called triple beam balances or quadruple beam balances. And so that's what you're gonna get a chance to do with these skill builders, is to actually read a balance. Now again, these are optional, uh, not required, but I do encourage you to, to get some practice reading a balance. Uh, there are two different levels of precision, one to the nearest 10th of a gram, the next to the nearest 100th of a gram. But uh, you can do those challenges. That will give you the mass values and then your volume value. Uh, if you wanna get the volume of an object, you would 
quite often use a what's called a graduated cylinder. And so this activity will give you a chance to read a graduated cylinder uh, in milliliters. So this will give you densities in grams per milliliter, which is one unit of density that is pretty common. As long as you've got a mass and you've got a volume on the, uh, in the denominator, mass in the numerator, you're talking about density. Oh, well, hi there. I guess you caught me sleeping on the job. I was, I was just grading module four discussion questions. Ah, oh, that felt good. I needed a little rest. Hey, this is my bed of nails. Do you ever lay on a bed of nails? Do you ever wonder why people can lay on a bed of nails? It's all about pressure. It turns out that when I lay on that bed of nails, you should be doing a little force diagram on me. You should realize that the earth is pulling down on me with a force. That force is called my weight. And the bed is supporting that weight, right? The reason why I'm not moving when I'm laying there is because the bed is pushing up on me with a force equal to my weight. I'm an object at rest. I'm at rest because there are, not that there are no forces acting on me, but the forces acting on, on me are balanced. So the earth pulling down on me is balanced by the force of the nails pushing up on me. Of course, a nail pushing on my skin could do a lot of damage, but it's not just one nail. Notice it's a lot of nails. So therefore, the amount of force exerted by any one nail on my skin is not that great, at least not great enough to puncture my skin. So the pressure, remember the pressure, is the, you know, the, the, the bed of nails has to exert a force upward equal to my weight. So that's a fair amount of force. Right? In fact, in my case, it's about 750 newtons of force is what these nails, but notice that that force is distributed over a, much, a fairly large area, and therefore, the pressure is not that great. The force over this area winds up being a low enough pressure that doesn't puncture my skin. Now, that'd be an entirely different situation if I, let's say, stood on the bed of nails. What if I took my shoe off? I'm not gonna do it, but what if I put my, took my shoe off and stepped on this bed of nails? I'd be putting that same amount of weight, right, that's still going to have to support me over a much smaller area. And therefore, the pressure on the bottom of my feet would be so great that it would most likely puncture my skin and do a lot of damage. I don't suggest you try that at home. Okay, time to do some desktop science. Now, I hope that you don't just uh, take all these explanations on the slides as absolute truth. You know, try them yourself a little bit if you can. You know, that's the cool thing about fluid mechanics or fluid dynamics is that you can do a lot of this stuff at home. In fact, at the end of your chapter, uh, you'll notice there's a little think and do section. Shoot, try some of those out. Uh, here's one of the slides that I wanted to, to talk about, uh, the one we just went through with the, with the cup of water. Imagine this cup of water is a swimming pool. Um, you've all, we've all dove to the bottom of the swimming pool and you feel something different, right? You feel more pressure on your ears the deeper you go. Well, why is that? Why is there more pressure at greater depth? It has to do with the fact that there's a column of water sitting on top of you and water can be pretty heavy. It's a fairly dense material. And so that column of water, when you're 12 feet down, that's a lot of weight that's pushing down on you. When you're farther up in the swimming pool, there's not as much water on top of you and therefore there's less pressure on you. Now let's just verify that. What I've done is I've taken a cup, I've put three holes in it, one at the top, one in the middle, one at the bottom. I've covered it up with some tape and I've filled it up with water. And now when I remove the tape, we're gonna see whether or not that last slide was telling the truth. And notice that my top hole is not, there's not even enough pressure there to even squirt the water out. But you can see that the middle hole is not shooting out quite as fast as the bottom hole. So I have more pressure at the bottom compared to at the middle. I notice that as my water level decreases, as water runs out of the cup, you'll see that both are wind up spurting out less and less because as the water level drops, 
there's less of a, of a column of water on top of both those locations and therefore less pressure. So eventually, there's my, my middle hold is kind of waning here. It's about to, to uh, not even have enough velocity to even shoot out anymore. And that's because of the decreasing pressure as the water level drops. Okay, I hope you've really been thinking about it. why is there pressure in a liquid? You know, we have all had the experience of diving in a swimming pool. Why do your ears feel different when you're like one foot below the surface compared to when you're dive to the bottom and you're 12 feet below the surface? It's all about the fact that you've got this column of water on top of you, and that column of water has weight. In fact, water is pretty heavy. If you think back to when we talked about the density of water, mass divided by volume, Water is pretty heavy. If you take a, a cube of water, one foot by one foot by one foot, if you can imagine a one foot cube of water, that thing weighs about 62.4 pounds. So now you're, imagine you're 12 feet down in a swimming pool, or it, it turns out it doesn't, have to, it doesn't matter if it's a swimming pool. What if it was a phone booth that was 12 feet tall and was full of water and you're at the bottom? Turns out you would experience the same pressure in either case. It doesn't matter the surface area of the body of water. All that matters is the depth. If you're 12 feet down, that means you've got a stack of these 12 foot cubes of water on top of you. Each one weighs 62.4 pounds. So you've got 12 of these cubes stacked up. That's like 720 pounds, right? That's really heavy. And it's heavy and therefore it produces pressure on you, which you feel in your ears. And it turns out it doesn't matter whether you have your head like this or like this or like this or if I could flip upside down, it doesn't matter your head's orientation. As long as you're 12 feet below the surface, you're gonna feel the same pressure. It acts in, every, in, in all directions equally. But pressure does depend on the depth, and that's what, that next, what the next slide is going to explain. Why the heck is there a buoyant force? And it's because the pressure on the bottom of an object, because it's deeper, is less than the pressure on the top of an object, because it's not as deep. That should explain then why there is a buoyant force to begin with. Okay, do you ever have the experience of going to the swimming pool and kind of horsing around with your friends? Uh, do you ever try to lift a friend beside the pool? Like not get in the water, but actually just try to lift one of your friends? It's a lot of work, right? You know, here, here's my friend, you know, my good old wooden block. You know, for me to, to lift my friend, it takes work, right? You know, First of all, if I can lift my friend, what's going on? Why is my friend not moving, right? You know, the earth is pulling on my friend with a force we call weight. And for that friend not to be, not to be dropping down to the ground, uh, I've gotta be exerting a force, right? An upward force, my lifting force must be equal to my friend's weight in order to lift them when we're out, you know, out by the side of the pool. Now, did you ever notice what happens when you're in the pool and you try to lift a friend? It's a lot easier, right? Why is that? You know, do a force diagram in your head. This is why I find the force explanation for why things flow to be so much more satisfying than just thoughtlessly saying something about the density of an object. This really tests to see whether you know physics, whether you're really understanding physics. If you can start to see the physics in the world around you and explain what's going on. So here's my, here's, my, here's my swimming pool. Not much, but you know, I'm on a teacher's salary. Here's my swimming pool. Again, it takes a lot of work for me to, to lift my friend right now. And of course, what happens when I, when I don't, don't lift my friend? My friend then is accelerated downward due to the force of the earth pulling on my friend. But now what, what if I don't lift him and I drop him in a cup of water here? Notice that he doesn't, you know, why is he not falling down to the ground? I'm not lifting him anymore, am I? No. The earth is still pulling on him with the same force, we call it weight, and yet he's not falling to the center of the earth. Why is that? There's another force, right? There's another force that's, that's acting on him. We call that the buoyant force. And that is the same reason why when you have a friend in the water, now you, you still have to support your friend, right? You still, you feel, you're, you're, but they seem to have lost weight. They don't weigh as much as they did outside the water. Why not? Because you know, you're not working as hard, why not? Because you're getting help from the water. 
the water is producing what's called a buoyant force. And in fact, right now, it turns out that you don't have to have a fully submerged object to in order to have buoyant force. In fact, if I can push my, now my block of wood is kind of small for my cup of water, but notice what happens when I do this. Now I have to actually push down, because what happens when I fully submerge my, my, my wood? You'll notice he's not moving right now. Why not? Again, he's an object at rest. The forces acting on him must be equal. He's got his weight, the earth pulling on him. Uh, there's a buoyant force upward. There's also a force of my finger pushing downward. Those, my, my finger pushing downward and the weight of the earth pulling on, or the force of the earth pulling on the block are right now equal to the buoyant force. But notice what happens when I remove my downward force. All of a sudden, he, he actually accelerated upward because the buoyant force was larger than the weight of the block itself. And so that he popped up until he got to the point where he's now balanced again. The forces acting on this block of wood are balanced. Its weight downward is equal to the buoyant force. But notice that the buoyant force here is smaller than the buoyant force when I have him completely submerged. And that's the topic of the next couple of slides, is why the buoyant force changes. It turns out the buoyant force is defined as the weight of the water displaced. Notice that how my water line, you can see where the level is of the water. Notice how the water line goes up as I submerge it. In fact, it gradually goes up until I get to a maximum value. It turns out that when I'm only partially submerged, I'm, only, I'm displacing a smaller volume of water than when I'm fully submerged. And that determines the buoyant force. When I displace less water, the water weighs less. When I displace more water, the water weighs more. And it's that weight of the displaced water that determines my buoyant force. I want to go back real quick and talk about, you know, first of all, why does the water level of this cup change when I submerge this piece of wood? Well, the wood takes up space where the water was, right? The, the, when the wood is submerged, it is pushing water out of its way. It's taking up space, so it's, it's pushing water out of the way, and that forces the water level to go up. Now, one thing that's very important is to not forget that fluids are liquids and gases. So yes, it's easy to start thinking about flotation um, with respect to a swimming pool. But don't forget that this atmosphere is a fluid as well. Right? These are air molecules. So when, I'm, when I stand in a room, what am I doing? I am pushing air that normally would take up this space where I'm right now sitting. There, I have to push air out of my way. I displace air. I'm at this big, I'm at the bottom of this big ocean of, of air, and I am taking up space where air molecules normally would be. So I'm displacing air. What if I could collect all, what if I could find a volume of air that is equal to my volume? Because that's what I'm, I'm doing. Am I not displacing a volume of air equal to my volume, just like this block of wood displaces a volume of water equal to the volume of the wood? Notice how that water level rose. If we could collect all that water that got displaced and weigh it, that would be the buoyant force. Likewise, if I could collect a volume of air equal to my volume and weigh it, that would be the buoyant force acting on me. So even me just sitting here in a room, there is a buoyant force acting on me. But just because you have a buoyant force acting on you does not mean that you float. The buoyant force must be equal to your weight. And it's pretty easy to see that it, it, a volume, if, I, if we had a balloon that was shaped like me, and we could collect all that air, you know, fill it up with air, that balloon would weigh a whole lot less than my actual body does. So yes, there is a buoyant force acting on me. It's the weight of the air that I am displacing. However, the weight of the air that I am displacing is way, 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 way less than my weight. So if you did a little, if you're doing a force diagram in your head, and you say, okay, what are the forces acting on Mr. Swanson? There's a downward force, thanks to the earth pulling on me. That's a big downward arrow and there is a buoyant force right I am displacing air and therefore the air that I'm displacing has weight which we define as the buoyant force there's a tiny little upward arrow clearly those are not in balance 
So what else has to be working? What, what, what's the other force that's acting on me? What's the, for, the support force of the chair? So it turns out the normal force due to the chair, really large force, and a tiny little buoyant force due to the fact that I am displacing air. Those two things combined equal my weight downward. All right, well, so in this video, I'm going to do a Boyle's Law demonstration. And uh, what I've got is I've got a nice blue, little balloon here. I just blew him up. I used, of course, the air from my lungs. This is not helium. So I've got air inside here, inside the balloon. And those air molecules that are in the balloon, of course, are zipping all around, and they're punching the walls of the, of the inside of the balloon. They're exerting a force, and we call that force pressure. So the amount of force they can exert over the area of the inside of the balloon, we call that the pressure inside the balloon. Of course, I've got air molecules out here in the room that are zipping all around, and some of them are hitting the outside walls of the balloon, punching inward, exerting force. And the balloon has the shape it has because the pressure from the air molecules here in the room punching inward is equal to the pressure of the air molecules inside the balloon punching outward. It's an even fight right now, and that's why the balloon has the size and shape that it does. What I'm going to do is I'm going to put my balloon now into a device called a bell jar. This bell jar is a very heavy, strong glass. And when I put my balloon inside the bell jar and put the bell jar on this platform, this platform is attached to a vacuum pump. And what the vacuum pump is going to do is it's going to take air out of the bell jar. Right now there is air in the bell jar. And those air molecules inside the bell jar are punching inward on the outside of the balloon. But what if I start to remove those air molecules? I use a vacuum pump to pull those air molecules out. We'll see what happens to the balloon. notice any changes. Remember the size of that balloon just a few minutes ago, a few seconds ago. Remember I'm taking air molecules out of the vacuum, uh, out of the bell jar. So I have fewer air molecules outside pushing inward. Still the same number of air molecules inside of the balloon pushing outward. Notice I'm not adding any air molecules to the balloon. All I'm doing is taking air molecules from outside and therefore I'm decreasing the pressure outside. And we see what a difference that makes. I've got some air sneaking in. I mean, here's a little hissing. In fact, I can remove, I can let the air back in much more rapidly by releasing this air. And notice that my balloon returns to its original size now we have an even fight again. I still have now have the same number of air molecules as we had before punching inward compared to the air molecules inside punching outward. Right now the pressures are, are even. But when I remove those air molecules from the outside, then my balloon was able to expand. The molecules inside were able to win that battle and make the walls of the balloon get bigger. Boils long. And when it does, it's going to be liquid water again. I'm going to have no water vapor molecules. I'm going to have nothing pushing outward. No air molecules inside the can to push out. That's what we call low pressure when there's no air molecules. Out here in the room, I still have air molecules. They're going to be pushing inward. And we're going to see who wins the fight. We're going to see what happens when I've got low pressure inside and high pressure outside. Let's give her a go. crush a can. In fact, I didn't even use my hands, did I? No. I used the air in the room. 
And so remember, I created an area of low pressure inside the can. High pressure out. So no air molecules pushing out, but you have plenty of air molecules pushing in with a force of 14.7 pounds for every square inch of that can. Have you learned about density? Yes. yes. So if this ketchup packet is floating in this water, what can we say about the density of the ketchup packet compared to the density of the water? It's not it's less dense. It's less dense, exactly. Something that floats in something else means that it is less dense than that something else, correct? Yeah. But I'm going to try to make this ketchup packet sink using the power of my mind. You ready? Sink, catch a packet, sink. Sink, catch a packet, sink. Sink, catch a packet, sink. Rise, catch a packet, rise. Rise, catch a packet. Sink, catch a packet, sink. Sink, catch a packet, sink. Rise, catch a packet, rise. What can we say about the density of the ketchup packet when it is sinking? Pressure. What about its density? Its density is greater, right? Its density is greater than the density of water. Otherwise, it wouldn't be sinking. So the question is, how could a ketchup packet have a density that is both greater and less dense than water? By squeezing. By squeezing. Okay. What I'm doing is, remember what density is? Mass divided by volume. The mass I can't change. I can't add or take away from that ketchup pack. But I can change its volume by squeezing it. So I'm actually making this ketchup pack a little bit smaller, therefore increasing its density and making it sink. But actually, the cool thing is that I'm not actually squeezing the ketchup pack, am I? No, you're squeezing the I'm squeezing the bottle. The bottle is squeezing the water. The water is squeezing the ketchup pack. That's something called Pascal's Law. Pascal's law says if you apply pressure to a fluid, such as water, that pressure is transmitted throughout the fluid, undiminished in all directions. This is why hydraulic lifts work. Do you ever see the hydraulic lift that lifts your car? Mm -hmm. It's thanks to... Cheater. 
As I mentioned at the beginning of this PowerPoint presentation, weather is a subject that is near and dear to my heart. I spent 10 years as a professional meteorologist. Six years uh, I was on television, and for four years I worked as the assistant weather editor at USA Today, which meant that I did print and online weather. And I produced a lot of graphics, weather graphics for USA Today, including the one that you're seeing on your screen here. The reason I did this one was because there was a video back from the early 90s of a television news crew that got very lucky. They were near Valentine, Nebraska, I believe, and they took shelter from a tornado under an overpass. And the, it was a camper crew, so the camera was rolling the entire time. And a lot of folks drew from that video that an overpass would be a good place to go if you were out caught perhaps with a, with a tornado in your vicinity. And it turns out that scientifically it's a bad place to be uh, because of Bernoulli's principle because of the fact that within the overpass you're actually creating a smaller surface area or kind of a smaller pipe for air to flow through it actually speeds up as it goes through an overpass or it goes under an underpass if you wish um, so the winds actually speed up and that means that with stronger winds, they could carry more stuff and have the have the stuff hit you harder. And that's really the big danger in tornadoes. It's not getting picked up and taken to Oz like Dorothy in the movie. The real danger from tornadoes comes from the potential for head trauma, people getting hit in the head with stuff. That's how most tornado fatalities occur. And most tornado injuries, in fact, are from head trauma. And therefore, you don't want to be putting yourself in a position where the winds are going to be any stronger than they already are. So I created this graphic just to point out that yes, it's Bernoulli's principle that makes an underpass a horrible place to take shelter during a tornado. Here's another graphic from my USA Today days. And I include it mainly just to point out that physics is everywhere and particularly fluid dynamics really plays a big part in, well, first of all, architecture. Notice that uh, if you ever travel to hurricane prone regions such as South Florida, you're going to see a lot more hip roofs than you're going to see gable roofs. And the reason for that is because a hip roof uh, creates smaller changes in pressure from the outside to the inside. And therefore, if you can minimize the difference in pressure, you're more likely to uh, keep your house or keep the roof on your house. So um, that's why you see just differences in design uh, from one region in the country to another uh, because of the potential for really strong winds. So I just thought this might be somewhat of interest to see how Bernoulli's principle again uh, plays a part in our daily lives. One final graphic to, uh, to highlight Bernoulli's principle. Uh, one thing I wanted to mention is that Bernoulli's principle only applies for smooth laminar flow. It does not apply when you have kind of chaotic flow. And that's what happens when you have icing on the front, on the, the uh, forward edge of a airplane wing. When you get ice there, you can't have smooth laminar flow and therefore you can't create that pressure difference that Bernoulli's principle creates. And therefore you can't get lift. And so that's the reason why planes go down when they get icing on the wings. Okay, a couple of more demonstrations, and then we'll wrap up this whole fluid dynamics thing. Uh, the first one, again, this is stuff that you can do at home, and I encourage you to try to do these. Um, all you need is a, whoops, 
All she'll need is a, a spool, a thread, and a nice straw. And you put your straw in through the main, the main hole of your spool so you can blow through it. And then what you're going to need is you're going to need a, 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 perhaps a, an index card. You know, I'm going to use one of my business cards there. And I'm going to uh, insert a little push pin. I just pushed a pin you know, right through the middle of the card. And you're going to put the business end of your pin, the, the pointy end, is going to be pushed up and through the hole from where the air is coming out of your spool. Now the question is, you know, first of all, what's going to, what would happen? Again, you should be doing a little force diagram in your head. Uh, what happens when I let go of the pin? It drops, right? Well, why is that? Because card has weight, pin has weight. Um, you know, of course, when I'm holding them here, they're not moving, and that's because I'm supporting them. But then when I let go, of course, they fall out. Now, what would happen if I blow through my straw and then let go of the pin? Any guesses? Let's find out. Did you expect that? The card actually stayed in place. Notice that after I started blowing, I removed my finger and the card stayed in place. Let's try it again. It only drops when I stop blowing. So it turns out that while it was held in place there, you should have been doing a little force diagram and realizing, ah, there's got, it can't just be just the weight of the card acting downward or the card would have fallen. The fact that the card stays in place tells me there must be an upward force. Where is that upward force coming from? Well, it has to do with the fact that I'm blowing air through this straw and it gets to this end and then what does it do? It's got to go somewhere, right? Well, notice, if you look really carefully, look really closely in there, there's not much space there, right? And all that air has to go, get out of there because there's more air coming behind. I'm still blowing, right? So therefore there's more air coming. That air has to squeeze through this small little space between the bottom of my spool and the top of my card really quickly. So it moves really fast. And what do we know happens when air moves really fast? The internal pressure, the pressure of that air that's squeezing out in between the bottom of my spool and the top of my card is really low because it's moving really fast. What else is around here? Aren't there air molecules down here? But they don't know what's going on up there. They're just hanging out. you got air molecules that are just kind of hanging out at a relatively high pressure compared to the air that's zip, zipping out in between the bottom of my spool and the top of my card. I'm creating low pressure there. Got high pressure air down here, low pressure in between here. And what does that produce? That produce, it produces what's called a pressure gradient force. High pressure air pushes upward on the card, keeping it in place as long as I can maintain that pressure differential. Okay, physics fans, here's a challenge for you. Again, this is one you can do at home. I encourage you to try it out. How would you get water out of this cup? Notice I got a cup that's got about halfway full of water. Again, I'm an optimist. Um, how would I get water out of this cup using actually a straw cut in half? Yep, and you have to use both parts. So remember, I've got straw, I've cut it in half, I've got two pieces. And the question is, how would I get water out of the cup? You know, and, and let's say I can't, I can't just flick it out. Right? I can't just, um, and another thing I can't do is I can't, I can't put, try to put them together and try to just suck it out like you normally would drink out of a straw. Now you do know why we can drink out of straws, don't you? You read that section in the book? Uh, you answered that question in these notes a little bit earlier? You should understand why, why, um, you, why you can drink out of straws um, and why you can't do that on the moon. But we're not going to do that in this case. So if that's off the table, if I can't can't reduce the pressure in the straw and, and let the atmosphere push the water up the straw and into my mouth, you know, how else can I get water out of this cup? Well, it turns out I can do something a little you know, closely related. It has to do with reducing pressure. But it may, it's reducing pressure in a way that you may not have considered before. So instead of putting my straws together and trying to suck up like this, what if I to do this in profile. Put my one straw in, in the liquid, 
And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to put my other straw right across the top of the other one. And I'm going to blow this time. Let's see if, we can, if you can see this. Let me get close. Ready? See the water spraying out? Instead of sucking, I'm blowing. I'm blowing air quickly across through this tube across the top of my other straw. I'm creating a channel of fast moving air right above the top of my, of my other straw. By Bernoulli's principle, we know that a fast moving fluid, including air, has low pressure. So I'm actually creating an area of low pressure right here at the top of my straw. And now my, the air of the atmosphere is able to push on the surface of the water, push it up the tube, and then it gets, of course, sprayed out. This is actually how aspirators work, if you've ever seen those really fancy perfumes. You know, perfume is expensive. You don't want to use very much of it. You wouldn't want to splash it on you. That would waste it. You want to create a very, very fine mist of perfume. That's all you need. Just a dab will do you. And what you actually have is they hit, you see those aspirators that have a, a nice bulb. Essentially, it's a bulb that's attached to a little tube, and the tube is across another tube that goes down into the liquid. So it's the same sort of setup. The tube going down to the perfume, you've got another tube across here that's attached to the bulb. You squeeze the bulb, that creates a, a channel of fast moving fluid across the top of the other tube, which then draws the liquid up and then it gets aspirated. It gets turned into very, very fine droplets so that you don't use very much of your perfume. All right, well, I hope that you enjoyed this extra application of Bernoulli's principle.